there, Kevin Cashin here at the Metallurgical Lab of Matherton Forge. You know, I don't think that there is a greater proponent than I am of using good known steel for blades. Indeed, I believe that the number one thing that any new knife maker can do to put themselves on the road to success is to resist that overwhelming urge that all new makers seem to have to use scrap steel and to spend that minimal amount of money on a fresh piece of high carbon steel with a known origin in chemistry. But with that being said, sometimes for sentimental, historical, or research reasons, we have a need for working with less than ideal raw materials. Such is the case for me on a current project where, for historical and symbolic reasons, I need to work with wrought iron. But wrought iron has virtually no carbon content and is not hardenable to any level that I would ever allow on one of my blades. One may be tempted to say that for a symbolic piece that it will never be used anyhow, but I have no control over what will be done 200 years from now with a blade that has my name on it. So I am now tasked with finding a way of making wrought iron into usable steel. Fortunately, there are historical processes that do just that called blister steel and shear steel. A similar modern process is called pack carburizing. Pack carburizing involves heating a sealed container that holds the low carbon metal surrounded by carbon bearing material. At high temperatures, the carbon bearing material evolves carbon rich gases kept in concentration by the container. Carbon from these gases are absorbed into the surface of the hot iron by diffusion to form a carburized skin or case. Being a product of diffusion, the depth of this carburization is determined by time and temperature. The greater the temperature, the less time is required. The difference between blister steel and modern pack carburizing is that blister steel was done with wrought iron as the raw material. You see, traditional wrought iron is loaded up with inclusions, mostly silica based and voids. When a large amount of carbon is absorbed by the wrought iron, it reacts with these features to form blisters on the surface of the steel, giving the product its name. When blister steel was stacked and welded down to refine the carbon distribution and inconsistencies, it was known as shear steel because at the time it was ideal for use in shears and other edge tools. In researching this process, one can find a few brief descriptions showing some of the work or the end product, but not many details on exactly how to do it. So I thought I would do a video showing my experimentation and findings so that others who may find it useful may have an easier time at making this fascinating material. Traditionally, charcoal was often the source of the carbon. And for my experiments, that was easy enough. You see, I keep plenty of natural hardwood charcoal on hand for smelting raw ores into bloomery steel for my historic sword projects. And there is always plenty of this leftover material that is just too fine for smelting, but will work great for pack carburizing. You can find lump hardwood charcoal at any store with a good selection of grilling supplies, but be sure that it is the real hardwood charcoal and not the briquettes, which you do not want. But simple charcoal can take surprisingly long time to lend its carbon to the steel to any depth. So additives known as activators were included in the, in the mix to create gases that would more efficiently transport the carbon into the metal. Modern carburizing compounds often include activators with some hazardous material concerns, ranging from barium to cyanide. Fortunately, the historical processes often used much friendlier additives, and I am all about exploring historical methods and especially keeping things simple. So two of these easy to obtain activators are calcium carbonate and sodium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is about as easy and natural as it gets in the form of clam or oyster shells or commonly found among your garden supplies. I happen to have a bag of pure calcium carbonate that I have been mixing with my chicken's feed. 
Sodium carbonate can be found in a very cheap and easy to use form at any store that sells pool supplies and is used to raise the pH level of pool water. But which of these two additives is the better carburizing activator? I decided to do an experiment and find out. After forging some wrought iron stock to the appropriate size, I surface ground eight pieces to identical dimensions of seven eighths by one quarter inch and eight inches long. For my experiment, I've mixed uh, the charcoal to the activator at a ratio of 60 to 40 percent. And so 40 percent calcium carbonate to 60 percent charcoal and 40% sodium carbonate to 60% charcoal. So here is the uh, containers that I've made that I'm going to use for this little experiment uh, with blister steel. I really wanted to use round stock, round tubing, instead of the square tubing, because whenever I want very even heating, uniform heating from all sides, I really prefer to work with a cylindrical uh, in interior. Whenever you have corners, uh, it, it, it's going to in inevitably result in uneven heating or hot spots or cold spots. But my local scrapyard supplier had nothing as far as tube stock in round for me to, to work with, but they did have these squares that were just about right for what I'm doing. So since I'm on a deadline, I had to do what I had to do, and I'm going to go ahead and go with these anyhow and try to space them evenly inside the burn chamber. Now one thing I very quickly learned uh, was to mix up the, uh, the, the carburizing material inside these gallon Ziploc bags. This allows me to really mix things in with uh, out breathing this black dust. Uh, it only took like a second or two trying to mix it in a bucket where all this black uh, fine material started coming out of the, uh, the powdered charcoal. Uh, this is a lot easier way to do it and then you can scoop it out and place it into the tubes. And so here we go, our wrought iron pieces will go into the tube and I've already placed a little bit of charcoal in here to hold them in position so that I can put them evenly spaced so that they're going to have an even amount of the carburizing material around them. And now for the sodium carbonate. There, now we have them evenly spaced so there'll be a good spacing of carburizing material around all the bars. And here we are with both capsules completely welded up and sealed. And I've, I've done this little arrangement uh, so that I can set this inside of um, my salt bath uh, burner chamber and just place a metal rod through here and suspend both of these tubes in the burner chamber. Uh, I thought it would work out really well. I'll just remove the salt tube from my salt bath burner and that'll allow me to have a controlled temperature burn by using the controllers that I'd usually use for my uh, salt baths. And here we go. I've started the propane burning. Uh, the burner's coming up to temperature. With this system, what I have is a thermocouple that is going in and measuring the top of the tubes. And it's feeding back to my salt bath controller, which I've set to 2,000 degrees. This will allow me to sort of walk away from the system and keep it at maximum temperature without it having, without having some sort of a runaway heat situation that could cause a meltdown of one of those tubes in there or to get things get too hot. Um, once things come up to temperature, the controller will take over for me and just maintain 2,000 degrees for the next several hours in which uh, we're going to be completing this process. So now that I've done all of that, it's just a matter of waiting.
And here we are, the firing is all done, and we've opened the canisters, and the results are already fairly interesting. Um, there may be some carburization that occurred to the wrought iron in the calcium carbonate mixture, uh, but I don't really get a lot of blisters here. There's, there's some evidence of a little bit of it going on, but uh, you can see over here, in the sodium carbonate mixture, the wrought iron did start to form some very nice blisters. So while they're not the big, bold blisters that uh, I'm familiar with with blister steel, it's definitely blistered. So the uh, sodium carbonate successfully produced blister steel. The calcium carbonate, well, we'll see. We'll see how much carburization actually occurred. We're, we're going to complete some uh, work with the microscope here. But this also could be a matter of my source. This, this may have been a more chemically pure uh, sodium carbonate, whereas my, my chicken feed additive may not have been ideal for this purpose, and maybe I could try an, another form of the calcium carbonate in the future. I've prepared samples from the wrought iron carburized with the different mixes and now it's time to have a look at what happened inside. The calcium carbonate mixture did carburize the iron and create a skin of steel to an average depth of about 48 thousandths of an inch in which plenty of perlite did form. Perlite is the lamellar mixture of ferrite and cementite. So only in that 48,000 skin did carbon contents reach 0.8% overall, while the center of the sample is still mostly ferrite or low carbon iron. The sample from the sodium carbonate mixture, however, is a different story, with a carburized depth of almost twice that of the calcium carbonate treated sample. But more importantly, between the perlite grains are healthy amounts of proeutectoid cementite. This means that in the first half of the carburized skin, carbon levels exceeded 0.8% enough to form carbide networks. This means that the skin has more than enough carbon to share, that the process of welding up shear steel would redistribute it to the small ferrite core and most likely produce a good high carbon product overall. So while the results seem clear that the sodium carbonate is the activator I would want to use, I still can't entirely give up on calcium carbonate since calcium carbonate was a very popular activator in the past.